Hi folks, I hope you're all doing reasonably well. Uh, life is fairly miserable politically in our country. So yet again, I want to take us out of our own misery and talk a little bit about other people's misery. So uh, before I do, I just want to say that, you know, we've talked about the World Food Program before, that the World Food Program got the Nobel Peace Prize this year, and that the head, his name is David Beasley. He's an American. He was appointed by um, President Trump, and he was a former governor of South Carolina, I believe. He's a Republican. But if you've seen him on the TV, he's a sort of cheerful, outgoing person who is pointing out that the World Food Program, rather than having to feed 80 or 100,000 people who are at the edge of starvation, it's now close to the population of the United States, over 300 million people. And he's pleading with billionaires around the world to each contribute 1 billion, he, they need 5 billion to keep some of the population of countries like Yemen and Syria and so forth alive. Um, it's well justified, I think, that they won the Peace Prize, and it's an interesting institution. And since there's so much condemnation of international institutions by our president these days, it's nice that the uh, uh, Nobel Committee named them as uh, getting the Peace Prize this year. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is the miserable universe of Mr. Putin these days. Uh, and to show the complexity of what is going on in his realm as compared to ours. So you will recall that Mr. Navalny was poisoned. Uh, he was meant to die one would assume, but he was rescued. He is still recuperating in Germany, who rescued him and uh, provided medical care. And um, that has had all kinds of much more broad gauged international spin-offs. Uh, Navalny says he's gonna go back to Russia. We shall see whether his health, et cetera, make that possible. Um, but there are links between Europe and Russia which are impacted by this poisoning. And as you may or may not know, uh, Russia's economy is 60% uh, oil and gas exports and 30% uh, of its gross domestic product is in oil and gas. So in order to maintain the rather miserable economy of Russia right now, they really need to sell their oil and gas. And therefore they are selling it to gas needy countries in Europe. There was something called the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which went from Russia through the Baltic Sea and some countries. Uh, which uh, was of considerable benefit to Germany, which is the greatest importer of natural gas. Natural gas, as you may uh, know, is the sort of transition fuel between coal and oil and renewables. And since the uh, Germany declined or shut down its nuclear facilities, unlike France, for example, uh, it's very dependent on the import of natural gas. That particular Nord Stream 1 gas line went, among other things, through the Ukraine, which is not very safe from the Russian point of view. So the uh, Russians decided to build a second Nord Stream pipeline, 700 and something miles long, that uh, goes through some other countries and avoids Ukraine. And they were, they're relatively within, I think, um, I don't know, 50 or 100 miles of completing that at the point of which Navalny uh, was gassed uh, or poisoned. And there was a lot of pressure on the German government to uh, disengage from the uh, pipeline. Uh, and the pipeline is funded by the Russians, by some European 
uh, as well. And Angela Merkel decided for a variety of reasons that don't have to, we don't have to go into detail, that she wasn't going to do that just yet. Um, and that's a fairly big international issue because when on one hand, Russia and Putin are dependent on one or more of these pipelines, the two pipelines provide some security for Russia being able to sell in the case one pipeline through one country gets shut down due to political conflict of one kind or another. And on the other hand, Germany needs the gas uh, but because it has, it, uh, it absorbs so much of the Russian gas, it actually has some leverage on Russia. And that's playing itself out in German politics, it's playing itself out in Russian politics. And to some extent, it is playing itself out in Belarus, which is another area of concern to Mr. Putin and his government. Because, as you know, there has been huge uprising about the outcome of the election in Belarus, which was said to have been um, it not, it, the election itself wasn't illegal, but the outcome was uh, tainted, badly tainted. Those demonstrations are still going on, and Levinchenko uh, and is an ally of, the, uh, of Russia and Putin. Uh, so the question arises, why isn't Russia just moving its military into Belarus? Um, well, it's trying to help Belarus and its government, but at the same time, because Russia is having so many international issues and troubles, Putin would like to avoid uh, having his military visibly, there may be security people, but visibly uh, going against the popular demonstrations in Belarus and helping Linuchenko, who is a nasty dictator who's been there a long time, um, get out of power. So the Russians are trying to mediate this particular dispute. And um, there is an interesting wrinkle to this mediation because in contrast to Trump, Putin is doing the reverse. He's completely isolating himself because of COVID. COVID is also serious in Russia. Uh, he is not meeting with any human of any kind, it is said, who has not quarantined for at least two weeks. And you might have seen pictures on the television of a kind of a tunnel that's built into his office where disinfectants are sprayed even on the people who have um, isolated themselves. So um, on the one hand, he is being very, very cautious in many ways. On the other hand, he has to kind of throw caution to the wind a little bit because the Belarus situation is really quite serious uh, in terms of Russia's notion of having a wider influence. Uh, Belarus, by the way, is very Russian, uh, was part of Russia, of course, the Soviet Union. And the population, unlike the Ukraine, is not anti-Russia. Uh, uh, the Belarusians, by and large, or any polls indicate they're pro-Russia. They just want to get this government, uh, uh, its own government, out of there. And they're not, unlike the Ukraine, they're not threatening to maybe join the European Union or looking west and east. No, they firmly look east but they just want to get rid of this particular government. So Putin is having his hands full in Belarus, trying to figure out some way uh, not to seem too hostile to the popular will and at the same time keeping a dictator in. So we shall see about that. So if that wasn't enough trouble for uh, Putin, there is um, Azerbaijan. Well, Azerbaijan is uh, uh, also part of the former Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union ended, Azerbaijan, like many of the republics, became quote unquote independent. But at the time, the Armenian part, otherwise known in the news as Nagora Karabakh, uh, was allowed to be separate. Uh, and there were negotiation in 1994, which were, had some violence attached to it, but there was sort of an understanding by both the Europeans and the Russians 
that that particular chunk of Azerbaijan could be uh, sort of Armenian directed. Now, Azerbaijan is a Muslim country, and the Armenians, of course, are, are Christian. And the Armenians have had a hard time with, you know, the Turks and historically uh, where the Armenians uh, stand and having their own government and the Armenians diaspora has been a conflict for a long time. By the way, there's a, there are a fair amount of Armenians in the, United, in the United States, especially in California. Uh, Fresno, I think, has the largest Armenian population outside of Armenia. Um, and we've had an Armenian governor in the past in California, or at least person of Armenian extraction. So there you have the odd thing of there now being a violent conflict, not just demonstrations, but a violent conflict. Uh, people are dying by the hundreds in this conflict because Azerbaijan wants the uh, Armenian split off uh, back because it says it's part of its country. And the Armenians are saying we had an agreement and we can be separate. Now, there are lots of actors involved here. And oddly, you, you wouldn't think this was the case, uh, the Russians have been supporting historically Armenia after it split off. And there is a Russian military base in Armenia. So they have a stake in Armenia. At the same time, of course, Azerbaijan was part of the former Soviet Union. And so Putin at the moment is playing it both ways. That is to say, he is providing help and arms to both sides. And who is external to this conflict supporting uh, the Muslim Azerbaijan? It is Turkey. Uh, so, all the sides are getting arms from everywhere, including there are a lot of American arms floating around in um, Nagora Karbadak. Um, and uh, Putin is very anxious to try to get this conflict controlled and has summoned the leaders of both of these, um, both Azerbaijan and the Armenian enclave. Uh, to Moscow to try to find some kind of solution. Now, the problem here is that Turkey is also part of it. And Turkey, as you know, is a member of NATO, uh, but NATO doesn't want to intervene here in particular, especially because NATO is so much weakened because of the United States. So here you see the impact of the US and Trump administration essentially condemning NATO for many things, threatening to get out of NATO, saying when he's reelected, he will get out of NATO. And so the centerpiece of NATO, both in terms of money and military and so forth, is the United States. And the United States is unwilling to get involved in this particular situation, or rather to allow NATO to put some pressure on Turkey to stop exacerbating the conflict and helping its Muslim brothers um, in Abrazarja. Um, so that is drawing in Europe to some extent, it's drawing in Russia, it's drawing in Turkey. Now Turkey, if it isn't complicated enough, has recently had something of an alliance with Russia. It's gotten airplanes and weapons from Russia. So Russia, on the one hand, has some influence on Turkey, or so it hopes that it can leverage Turkey, uh, you know, slowing down its support. So you have the Europeans, you have the NATO, you have Turkey, you have Russia, you have Armenia, you have a total mess out there. And it's a violent mess. The Abrazanis, uh, you know, are vicious in terms of wanting their territory back. The Armenians are digging in that they've had a deal. And there are conferences going on as we speak. We are told, we were told a few days ago, there was a ceasefire, but there wasn't a ceasefire. So that is a very serious conflict, which uh, Putin is right in the middle of and has to deal with. Now, if that wasn't enough, 
there is the business in Tajikistan, which is having conflicts, also former Soviet, uh, one of the stats. More serious yet is Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan is probably of the former Soviet uh, uh, portions that are independent, uh, is probably the most democratic of the various stands. They actually have elections, people come and go. And I won't bore you with the details of the complexity of what is going on in terms of jailing the elected government and releasing it, uh, different actors in the country playing off against each other. But yes, indeed, Russia is once again involved and Russia is trying to batten down the hatches there. So we have Belarus, we have Kyrgyzstan, we have Nagora Kalabakh, we have the pipelines, we have a Putin that is in a total mess, trying to batten down the hatches of the various former bits and pieces of the Soviet Union. So while everything seemed calm for a while, right? The Soviet Union came to an end, there was Russia, Russia has its political and economic issue, and all of these stands and Republicans are doing their own thing. Mostly they have dictators. For example, in Kyrgyzstan, the dictator has been in power for 28 years. Uh, you know, people are a little sick and tired of him. Uh, their, their election has opposition candidates, but the opposition are really offspring of the dictator. They're not really independent groups at all. So the chickens are coming home to roost in terms of the very messy part of the former Soviet Union. And Russia is in deep, deep trouble with all of its surrounding allies, with its fellow dictators, with its uh, attempts by younger generations, for example, in Belarus to say enough corruption, enough dictatorship. You would hardly want to be Putin right now. It is a total, utter mess. Now, Putin, of course, is also involved in the U.S. mess, right? Undermining the U.S. election. All the reliable intelligence agencies say they're very busy trying to, you know, discredit uh, the voting uh, of, even before the ballot, with the ballot, and so forth. So imagine yourself being Putin, more or less in a bunker in a country that is seriously uh, uh, conflicted over its own COVID crisis that has a very bad economic situation, both because it is entirely oil and gas dependent for the well-being of its economy at a time when oil prices have tanked, right, because of COVID, less oil use, uh, also more and more countries especially in Europe, but also elsewhere, switching to renewables. So it's resource that allows the economy to go, uh, to operate successfully. So, tr so Putin can show something that people's quality of life is getting better, is in what we would call deep doo-doo. Life isn't getting better, the virus is out there, he's beginning to have some opposition, then the, uh, even those who are not Navalny supporters, polls indicate that only 40% of the population of Russia thinks he's doing a good job right now. So if you think that uh, Trump has some difficulties, uh, and Trump, of course, is not balancing international balls very well. He's just dropping them. Putin has a whole bunch of balls in his hands right now. And it's sort of, uh, I can't imagine what it's like for him to get up in the morning saying, what do we do about Belarus? What do we do about uh, Abazajan? What do we do about, um, you know, other parts of the various countries? Uh, especially because almost everybody in the world seems increasingly, especially the younger generation, to be sick and tired of um, the dictators who've been in power for decades. And that seems to be unraveling. That is a very interesting development. 
because as American democracy, as we're used to it, seems to be unraveling, the Russian dictatorships around the world also seem to be unraveling. I mean, I'm exaggerating somewhat because some of the stands are still firmly in everybody's, everybody's hands. So on the one hand, Trump is tying his uh, kite to other dictators, to the dictator of Turkey, to Putin, to uh, various dictators around uh, other countries, and democracies everywhere are struggling. Uh, and part, the reason democracies everywhere are struggling is A, because there's also some corruption going on in some countries, uh, East Europe, uh, and some, uh, for example. Uh, B, because there are some dictators that have emerged in Europe. Uh, for example, Hungary, increasingly Poland, doesn't look very good. Um, there are democratic deficits and problems even in the best governed countries of South Europe and Central Europe uh, because of the virus. Uh, and because the governments are sometimes shaky, uh, or as in the case of Germany, it's the end of Merkel's reign and one doesn't know what else will come afterwards. And on top of that, you have the EU, which is sort of flailing about trying to do something and trying to intervene in the Abrazarjan situation, uh, trying to, um, you know, maintain links to its members, European Union members in East Europe, while the chaos of Brexit continues. So you have, to some extent, a weakened uh, NATO, a weakened EU, the US being out to lunch entirely, more or less, in terms of world affairs, and its various pronouncements are neither, uh, you know, are neither here nor there. Uh, and uh, you have a Russia which seemed to have been firmly in the hands of Putin and firmly in the control of Putin with respect to the former Soviet bits and pieces, or most of them anyway, uh, also unraveling. So um, we have, or we li are living in a very destabilized world. And because we are so focused on our own miseries at home, the destabilization of the rest of the world is becoming more serious by the day. Uh, Farid Sakarian, who I often mention, had a special Sunday night on how the world sees America, which you might find on YouTube and which is fairly instructive because American leadership is woefully uh, uh, missing in all of these affairs, whether it's with Putin directly or some of the other countries or with respect to Turkey. Um, and um, it's not just that American leadership is missing, it's the fact that there are no other leaders in the Western democracies who can take, his can take the US place. Uh, the strongest person was Merkel, but as I said, she's uh, fading uh, as she goes out of office. So the strongest leadership standing really is China and Xi, and he's taking full advantage of it. He's taking advantage of the mess with the various Russian bits and pieces. He's taking advantage with the mess in Europe. He's taking advantage with the absence of the United States. And the fact that we have different pronouncements every day and that most of what Trump says is either half true or a complete lie with respect to our relationship with China. Um, and uh, so when you look at the world from Mars, let's say, you would see a messy situation getting messier by the day. And these developments in the former Soviet Union have now created an entirely new set of messes. Not to mention things in Africa and South America and South Asia and the Middle East, which increasingly is getting, one would say, weirder and weirder. Um, Iran is waiting till after the election to see what happens to some extent. Uh, 
but I think that in the meantime, in the absence of US leadership and with all of these other messes, uh, it is not surprising that Turkey and Aragon would have the ambition of uh, reconstituting the Ottoman Empire. That is his mission. So Putin is trying to hold things together in the former Soviet Union. Uh, Aragon is trying to um, uh, reconfigure the Ottoman Empire, being very influential also in Libya and in various ways in the Middle East. Um, the U.S. is flailing about, and from the perspective of Mars, there is essentially no there there except for China. India, one could mention, but India is, uh, will have probably lost, economists think, 10 years of economic development given its various lockdowns, the virus, and, and all the rest. So India is not about to emerge as a competitor to China. How Humpty Dumpty will be put back together again is totally unclear. It's even totally unclear about how much all these uh, pipeline issues, uh, the Nord Stream issues, the Russian economy, the difficulties in the former Soviet Union, the mess in the Middle East, uh, the uh, uncertainty about the European Union with respect to Brexit and how that will all look, uh, nothing is clear at the moment. And I know you'd like me to end on some kind of cheerful note, but sometimes you can say a big mess somewhere can only lead to disaster, and sometimes a big mess helps create a whole new dynamic and a new restructuring. The most positive thing one can say or hope for is that as the mess in various parts of the world get worse and worse, it may very well be that uh, the world will have to, various institutions, various leaders will have to look at themselves and others and say, whoa, we've got to figure out how to do this differently. Let us only hope. So be well for the next couple of weeks. See you then.